Good evening, everyone. We're just going to give everybody a moment or two to log on and we'll begin shortly. All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our next installment of In the Middle, Managing Your Midlife Transition. Our topic tonight will be from your core to your pelvic floor, staying strong during menopause. And our host this e evening is Susan Loeb Zeitlin, MD, FACOG, NAMS. And she's an assistant professor of clinical obstetrics and gynecology and a certified menopause practitioner. She's the director of the Weill Cornell Medicine Women's Midlife. Center, and it is my pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Loeb. Thank you so much, and thank you all so much for joining us tonight for this important topic that comes up daily in my office. So there are many changes that occur to our bodies during perimenopause and menopause, and this is a concern for many women. So it's, this evening's webinar is focused on how we can stay strong as our bodies change, from our core to our pelvic floor and the bones in between. So I just want to introduce the topic a little bit. So to start with um, how our bodies change, you know, there is often a weight gain that occurs during the menopause transition, and there are changes in the body composition and fat distribution. So menopause, independent of our age, can be associated with increased fat in the abdomen, as well as decreased lean body mass. And these changes are associated with increased cardiometabolic risk factors, such as elevated blood pressure, insulin resistance, inflammation, and our lipid profile. So it's really important that, that we address this and talk about it. The next thing we'll talk about is osteoporosis, which is a thinning of the bones that's caused by a decrease of in estrogen as we go through menopause. My last webinar was all about that, but it's important to know that bone loss is particularly rapid in the five to 10 years around the menopause transition. And this rapid bone loss can damage our skeletal function, weaken our bone, and increase the risk of breaking a bone or fracture. So we'll talk about what we can do about that. And then finally, we'll talk about the pelvic floor, which can weaken during this time. And that can lead to changes in our genitourinary tract. We've discussed this also in detail in a previous webinar, but we'll touch on it a bit more this evening. So tonight, I am thrilled to be joined by my colleague and friend, Dr. Jacqueline Bonder. Dr. Bonder is an associate professor and serves as the medical director of the Women's Health Rehabilitation at Weill Cornell Medicine. She provides comprehensive musculoskeletal and rehabilitative, rehabilitative care to women with a particular interest in conditions rate related to the pelvic floor, muscle dysfunction and weakness, chronic pelvic pain, urinary and bowel incontinence, as well as lower back pain, groin, abdomen, and hips. Her other areas of expertise include musculoskeletal problems related to pregnancy, postpartum pain, weakness, tingling and numbness, sports injuries, and rehabilitation following gynecologic surgery. So, so much and so much about what we're talking about. So thank you for joining us. I'm thrilled that you're here. So let's get started talking about what we can do to stay strong and help our bodies um, both prevent and resist some of these changes. So let's start with the basics. What do you do? What is your job as a rehab medicine physician? So we, well, first and foremost, uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation or rehab medicine physician um, is probably one of the most unknown specialties within medicine. And so a, always a great opportunity to promote what we do and who we are. We also probably have one of the um, one of the specialties that has more names than we really need. Uh, we're sometimes called physical medicine and rehabilitation doctors. Sometimes we're called physiatrists, and sometimes we're called just rehab doctors. So, or actually, and then you called me a rehab medicine doctor. So, you know, there's lots of different names that we hold, uh, but mostly we're specialists who really focus on the treatment and recovery of different neurologic and musculoskeletal injuries, pain, or when an accident happens, uh, basically through non-surgical modalities, at, such as physical therapy, medication, sometimes injections. But we're really doctors who kind of specialize in exercise is medicine. 
um, in a lot of different ways. And so that's one of the big things uh, here to promote tonight. Um, you know, we often can see patients that have have had a stroke who need rehab medicine and need to rehabilitate through exercise, but also any kind of orthopedic, musculoskeletal, sports, aging related uh, aches and pains that can be healed through either met exercise, like physical therapy and other modalities. Uh, so that's us in a nutshell. And um, you're specifically for women, right? right? Yeah. So, so as a woman's health specialist within rehab medicine, which is a growing specialty within our field and really hasn't existed for that long, uh, we, I really focus mostly on seeing women of all ages for these types of musculoskeletal problems and really focus at this point in my career, seeing mostly, you know, patients who have questions about exercise as they get, as they go through the life cycle, but also um, pelvic pain. And like you mentioned earlier, pelvic pain, pelvic floor problems, pregnancy related issues. But in the end, uh, it's really about the, the differences between a woman's body and a man's body and what we go through in our life cycle, kind of from a more musculoskeletal perspective. So who should come to see you? When should I be referring patients to you? And when should patients refer themselves to you? So, you know, anyone that, you know, I, it's so hard to encompass like who can see me because there's so many different women that can, uh, but really I see mostly adults. So really anyone over the age of 18 through being postmenopausal until, uh, you know, whatever age we, we live to that really have any type of um, aches and pains. But at this point, most of my practice is really focused on pelvic pain and pelvic floor issues, vaginal pain, um, hip and low back pain that may radiate to the pelvic floor or vice versa. That's one of my really big areas of interest is that there's a lot of pelvic floor pain and a lot of vaginal pain or pain that um, presents as maybe hip pain or back pain and is really, you know, not just hip or low back pain. So if you might go see one of those specialists and they're not, you're not getting better, maybe the pelvic floor needs to be looked at and addressed. Um, and then there's the, the, the little bit less relevant for this uh, for this talk is the pregnancy and postpartum related uh, patients who have, might have like back pain during pregnancy or musculoskeletal pain during pregnancy or injuries afterwards. But everyone on the talk may have, you know, friends, daughters, sisters, cousins who, who are in that period of life. And so I see them as well. You are a very important person to know because so many women have aches and pains. And again, so <laughs> many women have these body changes. So Let's start talking about basically the core and the body and the changes that are going on. So in the beginning, I mentioned that the body changes shape and fat distribution very often. It comes up daily in my office, even in women of different sizes and shapes still notice that their bodies are changing. So can you elaborate a little bit more on that? What's happening? Yeah. So as women's bodies change and as we get into the more perimenopausal uh, life um, cycle, you know, the, the type of fat that we have changes and the, the distribution of the fat changes as well. So we tend to store more what we call visceral fat, which is fat that kind of accumulates more around the organs deeply in the abdomen. Uh, and sometimes it's harder to actually see, but is there. But then also that because of that, plus fat distribution that happens more in a woman's midsection, you know, somewhere between the, the rib cage and the pelvic the bones or the hip bones, what most of us think of as the hip bones, the, the the fat redistributes there as well. And even sometimes on our, you know, on those love handles kind of in that area uh, to make a woman more of an apple kind of shape rather than a pear shape, or if you want to think about it that way. So that's really, you know, one of the, in terms of our body shape, you know, also uh, our metabolism might change in terms of fat stores and how we metabolize fat. And so women tend to break it down less during, you know, during the perimenopause and into menopause. And so that also changes. Uh, also, you can also see that effect on her body. So let's talk about that a little bit, because we want to know, everybody wants to know, what can we do to either prevent it from happening or to kind of do something about it once we do notice those changes in our body? Obviously, diet is important, right? Sure. I mean, you know, I think that it sounds really common, you know, like like uh, second nature to know that it should be diet and exercise, you know, that's not news. Um, but really it's about what kind of diet and what kind of exercise, how much exercise uh, you should be doing. So, you know, talking about a healthy diet really is, is, is balanced. 
right? So, you know, the thought is, is in terms of storing the type of, storing the type of fat that we were, what I was just mentioning, you know, you can lessen that by eating more lean fat and fewer carbs, you know, some, a little bit more unprocessed type food. So I think that that's an important point in that, you know, processed food that have a lot of sugar and a lot of additives, you know, is, is harder to break down and that can lead to more fat stores. And then, you know, fewer carbs also, you know, if you eat the more carbs you eat because you're breaking down that more slowly, it stores more as fat. And so that's a good habit to get into in terms of diet. Yeah. Uh, I talk about this a lot. Like I know, like we know carbs are harder to metabolize and focusing more on plant-based eating. So I don't, I'm not saying to become a vegetarian necessarily, but focusing our diets more on the plant-based eating is definitely helpful for this. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely agree. I think that, you know, nuts, you know, uh, good and then good fat, right. And talking about good fat is a lot of time are plant-based. And so, you know, whether it's nuts or avocados or, you know, olives, you know, things that are really, you know, kind of come from the ground and have been, um, you can eat naturally, I think are, we're learning is are good for everything, you know, from yeah. whether it's from inflammation and, and, uh, fertility, you know, all these different things that really it becomes important to eat more natural rather than, you know, the processed food that you and I probably grew up. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. I also say Mediterranean ish diet. Like, you don't have, you know, is, sure. that's a good way to focus. Right. Um, right. I'm not a big right. fish eater, so I always forget about fish, but yes, fish is yeah. good. Too. Yeah. All right. And then you already mentioned diet and exercise. So exercise is important, right? So Kind yeah. of basic, I will go into detail for specific parts of our body, but basic exercise that's recommended for, for women at this point. So basic exercise, it's, it's, uh, we try to tell people that they should get 150 minutes of exercise a week. So, you know, how, however you can break that up, you know, so most people will find it most attainable by saying 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise five days a week, but you can do it however you can fit it in. So just trying to get that 150 minutes and um, and moderate intensity is usually not, you know, what does that usually mean? Moderate intensity is we often will say is kind of, you can hold a conversation, but you might get a little breathy from holding a conversation, uh, you know, so you can go for a walk with a friend and, and still be considered moderate intensity. And so, you know, using that, using how you can hold a conversation as a level of intensity is, is often helpful. Uh, you could also, uh, equivalent of like a, of a of 30 minutes, five times a week, or, you know, 150 minutes is 75 minutes of vigorous exercise. And so that's where, you know, you're working out a little bit more heavy, heavily and really more breathless and probably can't hold a conversation while you are getting your heart rate up pretty high and you're working to breathe pretty heavily. That's if you do that type of exercise and that, you know, fancy that and that's your thing, then, you know, you can do 75 minutes a week as opposed to Sorry, 75 minutes twice a week as opposed to, um, no, sorry, 75 minutes a week as opposed to 150. So and in then, addition to that, right, so that's yeah. been part of a regimen for me in particular, right? But I've also added strength training because as we said, our bodies want to add fat but we and lose the muscle, but we have to build up our muscle, right? Do you want to talk about strength training a bit? Yeah, sure. You know, so, and that, you know, and that's part of the recommendations as well in general is to do two days a week of muscle strengthening for each body area. And so, you know, the body areas are usually broken down into, you know, arms, shoulders, back, uh, hips, you know, glutes um, and legs. And so, you know, it seems overwhelming, but there's also a lot of exercises out there that incorporate, uh, we call compound exercises where you can do more than one body part at a time. And so, you know, those are good exercises to look for to kind of make it most efficient in a, in a time period, uh, you know, and so, um, and it can be any, from a muscle strengthening standpoint, it can also be any type of muscle strengthening. So it can vary really from like heavy weight training and picking up heavy weights and, you know, maybe not starting out, but what's heavy for you, like, you know, just start out and then kind of progressing that and lifting heavy weights, which we often will say is like, you know, you do less repetitions with heavy weight versus something that's a little bit more resistive and you can do, uh, more, uh, reps or, longer periods of time, like Pilates or bar exercise, where you use more repetition to build muscle mass. And both are good. They're both great. Right. Exactly. Right. They're both good. You know, you, they both work different types of muscle fibers that you have in your body. So, you know, you can think of them kind of as like your sprint and your marathon muscles. 
And basically, you know, you work both types by doing both types of exercise. But in the end, whatever you enjoy is really key. So if you only enjoy doing heavy weight training, then just do heavy weight training when you can get it in and do it. If you only enjoy bar Pilates or bar or something more like that, you know, yoga, then then do that. Oh, it's so important to enjoy what you're doing. It's not always fun, but it's so important, right? A good question just came in. Can you gain weight if you do weight training? Yeah. I mean, it's not going to prevent you from, you know, gaining weight. It's going to help you burn fat more easily because you're going to have more lean muscle mass and you'll um, burn fat more easily, but you still have to, you know, monitor how much intake you're, it you, doesn't mean that you can eat, you know, fatty, fatty foods and you won't gain weight. You, even if you build up your muscle mass, you're still, you can still be at risk of gaining weight in those places. It's really that balance of the exercise and diet. And uh, does, if you build more muscle, will you just by virtue of building more muscle, gain more weight? I think that's oh, the question. So, Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> okay. I misunderstood. No. So yeah, yeah. There is a, you know, there is the uh, saying that muscle, you know, muscle weighs more than fat. So when you get on the scale, uh, you may see that, you know, inevitably that even though you look leaner and you feel leaner and may build the muscle, you make your, the number on the scale might not change. And that, well, frankly, that's um, more important if your body right. is getting into better shape, right? Right. And all, and, and what's more important is all those, you know, all those medical, uh, you know, medical profile that we discussed earlier in terms of watching your lipids and watching your, your diabetes numbers and making sure all of those and going through your regular checkups and seeing it on as measurable in those ways, rather than on the scale is, is more important. Yeah. And while we're just talking about what we have to do to kind of keep our bodies healthy, we can't neglect to mention how important sleep is. And of course, that is challenging for so many women who are waking up with hot, hot flashes or night sweats, right? But um, if we're not sleeping well, we're not optimizing our body, right? Do you want to? Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm not a sleep specialist by any means, but I think that, you know, studies do show that uh, uh, sleep becomes important in terms of how you, pro how you regulate your body temperature, but also how you, how you process foods and how you, uh, ultimately build muscle. You can build muscle like while you're sleeping, if you've done all those exercises and so, so getting the right amount of sleep and being restful, and then also having the energy to do your day and do your exercise becomes very important. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So let's move on to talk a little bit about our core. Our core we know is so important. We want to strengthen our core. What is exactly our core when we always talk about that? <laughs> yeah. So your core, you know, I think that, you know, these days more and more people are, you know, know what it is in the sense that it's not just your abs, right? Like, so it's not just your abdominal muscles or that six pack muscle, you know, it's the the fad of like getting a six pack is gone, you know, with like the Baywatch era of like, you know, seeing all these lifeguards with these great bodies. I mean, those are, it's all great, but it's to me, that's not, that's not the core, right? So the core really, the muscles really that incorporate the core are those abdominal muscles. And you have several abdominal muscles, that six pack muscle, which is called the rectus abdominis is the one that you see most but your oblique muscles, which are the muscles that kind of sit on your high, on your sides and really are like your, those love handle muscles that I talked about earlier, uh, your back muscles. So any of the muscles that kind of help support your spine and, and are in the, in the back are all part of your core. And then lastly, of course, well, not lastly, but the two things that kind of make it on top and the bottom are your diaphragm, which is becomes really important as a muscle to kind of help coordinate breathing when you're exercising, but then the pelvic floor. And so that often gets, you know, neglected in terms of strengthening and people, we, we, we in the pelvic floor world will actually say the pelvic floor is the floor of your core. And so, you know, the, the importance of that and kind of incorporating that into your exercises uh, is important. And, you know, you know, why is it important? I mean, you know, the abdominal muscles, you know, the core muscles really do so much for us. You know, they, they protect our spine from injury when we're exercising, when we're lifting, doing things. But all these muscles also help prevent um, falls and injuries related to falls and then our and our balance as well. Yeah, we'll talk more about that. But they also yeah. are really important for our posture, right? So we don't get hunched over. Yeah. So we stand yeah. up tall, yeah, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. right, exactly. Yeah, you know, I yeah, I always say to patients, you know, the, one of the, I see a lot of patients, especially the pregnant and postpartum with like tailbone pain or pain like down, who like, you know, like, it, they're like, well, it's worse when I sit. And I'm like, well, what happens when you sit up straight? And they're like, 
oh, that feels better. And I'm like, well, that's why you need to go strengthen your core for your tailbone pain, right? Because mm -hmm. sitting up straight is a lot for our core. It takes, it's a lot of endurance. And that's why we all slouch and, pop, you right. know, and lean back is because to sit up straight for a long time is really, really fatiguing. And so strengthening your core from a sitting perspective becomes important too, especially for our, our posture when we're sitting, but also when standing and, you know, and walking around and, you know, carrying a, you know, a purse or a backpack, you know, all of that, it, it can really strain the upper back and the shoulder area. So you want to maintain that kind of core strength and then upper body strength as well through your posture. And in some ways, maybe not always, can help us lose those inches that women lose. Yeah, well, right. yeah. I mean, that's just ways. got more muscle mass, right? To yeah. help lose those inches to replace muscle with, you know, replace fat with muscle. Um, I also, also mean height inches. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, uh, both, it, but both, right? Right, right, right. So you're right. As we age, we tend to shrink and kind of, you know, go yeah. down even more. And so, yeah, for sure, the, the, you know, working on posture and standing up straight, you know, sitting up straight and having the strength to do that. Can help your your height overall but also this way too so that's good right? yeah, um, so let's talk about some of the best ways to strengthen our core sure uh you know i'll put out there i think one of the you know the most important points about starting an exercise program if you're not exercising already is really start at your level and that's you know the best way to do that and so the best way to start a core strengthening program is to understand what your level of exercise is and where where you are at the moment when you're starting. Um, but it really, the best way to overall do it is through exercises that, uh, in, you know, will engage a specific body part of like the muscles that we just talked about. So like the abdominal muscles or the, you know, the different abdominal and leak muscles. So the exercises like that are usually like planks and side planks, um, but those those kinds of exercises will also engage your, your back muscles and your glute muscles too. And so it's a great way to kind of fire up your core and get everything strengthened. A more simple exercise and that that uh, can also strengthen the, the back, but also the abdominal muscles in the core are, are what I call dead bugs. Uh, dead bugs are kind of, if you, you know, and I'm giving, trying to give words that if people want to look them up and what they are, they, they can, but dead bugs are basically you're lying back like, like on your back with all extremities kind of up like a, a dead bug would. And you kind of move one extremity at a time and try to engage your core during that. And that's a really good exercise too. Uh, I don't know, I could go on with others. Yeah. Uh, you know, the like the other one I like are Supermans where if you're laying on your back, on your belly, uh, you know, these are all, you can kind of, you know, you kind of lift your arms and lift your legs like as if you're flying like Superman can really strengthen your back muscles in a way that shouldn't strain your back too much and is really, you know, kind of safe. And that's, you know, one of the most important things is like thinking about what health conditions you have in terms of exercise and making sure you don't exacerbate anything. And le listening to your body, if something doesn't feel right, don't do it, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, there's gonna, always going to be those people that push through that pain and they're like, oh, it's okay. I'm in pain, but really, you know, listen to your body and, you know, you don't want to you know, uh, uh, ignoring an ache and pain, you know, for a week or so can easily become an ache and pain that lasts, you know, six months to a year if you don't treat it early and you don't really try, you know, nip it in the bud. So if it came on while you were exercising, you know, rest, dial it back a little bit and really try to uh, take it easy. Yeah. If you need to. Yeah. That all sounds great. Um, so we talked a bit about, you know, strengthening the core for our balance too. And um, balance is such an, we'll talk about osteoporosis in a minute, but, you know, osteoporosis, which weakens our bones is a major, as we, if we fracture our bone, it's a major cause of morbidity and mortality as we age. So trying not to fall in and making sure our balance is um, as good as it can be is important. So how can we work on our balance? So like you said, so balance, you know, is important to prevent, you know, so many uh, issues that can cause more, even more problems. So like, you know, it's the way that we can do that, are, the, you know, there's multiple ways and simple, like a simple way you can do at home and you can do is just like to practice like heel toe walking. So, you know, kind of like you're on a tightrope and just kind of walking with one foot in front of you, of the other and trying to work on, you know, not kind of falling out of balance that line is a, you know, a great way to start um, and kind of just working on basic balance. Another 
you know, there's a bunch of different other activities. A lot of people will like working with like a balance ball or a balance board. So a board is one of the things, you know, you may stand on and it's kind of wobbles a little bit, but it forces you to do just to catch yourself. And it will, is a really um, kind of easy way to, I mean, it's not easy to do, but it's, it's simple. It's not easy. It's simple to exercise, to kind of uh, wake up the core and kind of, you know, so that if you, you know, it kind of helps where if you're like stepping off a curb or you're doing, and you misstep a little bit, it helps you catch that, that um, yourself from falling and practicing those types of things. Another great, uh, you know, balance exercise that is good for the, you know, besides your balance, but also good for the core or like single leg activities. So standing on one leg, doing a, you know, a bicep curl or something, you know, at the same time, or just standing on one leg and raising your arm up and, you know, your arm up to kind of help, you know, make sure that you don't fall, fall over, you know, and, and is really um, important. And I think that one of the, the biggest things is, is that if you're doing it at home and it doesn't seem to be working, you know, it's probably, you're probably, you might not be doing it correctly, right? So that's an, another big point. And when you're starting to exercise is like, that all of these exercises are like not, you know, they're not simple to necessarily do in the sense that you have to learn how to engage your core and use the right muscles when you're doing the exercise, which is if you're not seeing the benefits of the exercise that you're doing, then talk to someone like myself or a physical therapist or a trainer who can kind of go over some of these exercises, uh, you know, with you. Yeah, I've had, I, I think you made a really important point that you have to do these exercises safely. So if your balance is already poor, you have to be careful that you're not going to fall while you're doing these exercises. Right. I've had a trainer even tell me, um, you know, make a pot of tea and hold on to the counter while you're making your pot of tea and then just stand right. on your tippy toes up and down. And that's already good exercise for. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's, it, there's, there's so many different things that you can do within your daily life that can help you know, with that kind of um, balance and, and help it improve. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you really want to make sure that you're not doing anything to worsen a situation before you start to make it better. So, uh, and that's where, uh, you know, and I'll also put a plug in for things like Tai Chi and yoga, you know, from a, an exercise perspective, you know, Tai Chi, especially that's, that's really the, the premise of it is to focus on balance and flexibility and, and strengthening. So, you know, it's, yeah, a great exercise to to get into as we age. Yeah. And walking too, right? Yeah. I think I have that. I think that, yeah. Yeah. Like, I think that that um, uh, is another that I often occur, encourage patients to, to do is that, you know, walking and especially on uneven surfaces. So kind of going out like outside and kind of, you know, whether you, I mean, if you have access to the, a park or, you know, or a hike or something like that, like where you have to walk on uneven terrain a little bit, that can also really help your joint proprioception, which is understanding where your joints are in space. And that in turn helps your balance. And the beach, I think that's a good place, right? Yo, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, summer, well, here in New York. Right, exactly, getting there. Um, um, and do you have strategies that you can recommend to like to prevent falls? So preventing falls, you know, you know, it, it can get complicated because there, you know, it can get, you know, in rehab medicine, we, we like how you said before, the morbidity and mortality of, of, of a fall or a hip fracture or things that can kind of come once someone does fall and gets injured, you know, is when we send them back home after an injury like that, you have to make sure that their home is safe. So, you know, one strategy to prevent falls is, you know, to look at your, you know, where you spend the most time, uh, you know, for most of us, that's probably home or work and make sure that there's nothing that you're going to trip over. You know, there's like, you know, rugs aren't kind of being, you know, easily tripped over or uh, pieces of furniture that you, you, you know, can easily like stub your toe on and then fall, you know, things like that become important to recognize as, as we age to kind of help prevent falls. And then really, you know, out in everyday life, I think the best thing to kind of prevent falls is really doing these kinds of exercises. And I'm not sure it's, it can't really, you know, if your balance is off, you know, there's probably a lot of people who hate me for saying this is that like, you know, if you're really having trouble, like we're having, if you, like it's better to walk with a cane or something to help your stability until you get it stronger than, than fall. Like, yeah. you know, but vanity is a thing for a lot of people. And so people don't necessarily want to, but at the same time, it really, there, there's a, a good reason to do it if you really need to. 
Right. So let's talk about the bones and how we can strengthen them. So we know, or we uh, we are aware that our peak bone mass is at the age of 35. So obviously we want to strengthen our bones by the age of 35. So many women did that or do that or haven't done that. So here we get to our menopause transition and there's already some bone loss that's being seen. So um, we see it a lot. And so um, when we start seeing some bone loss, um, or even before we talk about doing weight bearing exercises, right? So we've talked a bit about that, but what are, what are weight bearing exercises? Like what what are good weight bearing exercises? So you know, weight bearing exercises um, in general are ones that you know basically put um, that are either like gravity resisted or that literally put weight into a joint. So you know, weight bearing, you know, it's either you're walking on your legs or, you know, I mean, most of us are not doing handstands and walking on our hands, but a weight bearing exercise, like a push up or a plank is considered weight bearing. Uh, you know, and then there's the different classes of types of exercise that can be weight. So there's, you know, there's the cardiovascular side of exercise, but also that strength training side of exercise, which there's weight bearing types of both. And so, you know, to get those 30 minutes of, of cardio in, uh, five days a week, uh, sorry, the 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise five days a week, you know, cardio, cardiovascular exercise, like treadmill walking or running. Um, actually, well, running is a little bit high impact. So if you have osteoporosis, you kind of want to be careful, but to build the bone really treadmill walking, hiking or running up, you know, walking on an incline, uh, tennis, dancing, rowing, anything where you're using your joints and putting weight through your joints um, is considered weight bearing exercise. And then really almost every strength training type exercise is considered uh, weight bearing. There's, it's hard to find one that's that's not. So you don't and have to carry weights for it to be weight bearing, but it doesn't hurt if you carry weights for it to be weight bearing, right? Correct, correct. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I guess if you were doing like a biceps exercise without a curl without a weight, that's not that's not really weight bearing, but it's, it's gravity resisted. So if that's where you are, then that's okay, uh, you know, and so you'll work up to kind of using a weight, but you can also use, you know, one of those bands that you can get that can kind of help do some, you know, light resistance uh, if you need to. Right. So, yeah. Um, so. so now we get, those are women who want to kind of, uh, there are women who come in who already have osteoporosis. So they're at risk of fracture. So I think they have to be super careful so that the exercise doesn't cause a fracture, especially if the bones are really uh, brittle and weak. So what is what is unsafe to do if you already know that you have osteoporosis? Right, so, you know, obviously it really, it also depends on your medical history besides the osteoporosis, because there's, you know, different types of, uh, you know, conditions that, so, you know, I, what I often think of is like, if you have a, spinal issues and, you know, something, you know, like arthritis in your spine or back pain, you want to be careful doing too many um, twisting motions and set anything that's too forceful. So if you have a history of, of osteoporosis and your bones are already weakened, anything that puts uh, a, a lot of impact into the joint at once can be harmful. So examples of that are, are you know, using weights to force twist, uh, twist forcefully. And so if you're holding, you know, and, and kind of going back and forth, that can really put a lot of weight on the spine and cause you know, a type of fracture in the spine that's common with osteoporosis. Uh, if you are uh, have osteoporosis, also, we, we really don't like women to do like full sit-ups or like kind of bending forward and kind of, um, you know, doing anything that kind of curls or bends the spine, what we call forward flexion, because that puts also puts the, the the vertebrae of the spine in a, in a compromised position that can cause, that increases a risk for that type of fracture called a compression fracture. And so, you know, if you have osteoporosis you, and you're going to start weight training, you really want to make sure that you do the right exercises. And those are just a few that can be harmful if you're not doing them correctly or if you do them at all sometimes. So definitely, you know, something to, to talk about. And then, um, and lastly, I would just say, if you have osteoporosis, doing a lot of high impact and high intensity exercise is probably not the greatest thing to do. It's a great high intensity exercise is great weight bearing exercise, but usually, you know, we would prefer someone to start it early when they're young to build their bone mass 
and before they get the diagnosis rather than after. So you've taught me so much over the years, but that is one of the really important things that if your bones are brittle, you really do have to be careful. And um, like the full sit-ups are, are really not healthy for you to do. And right. that's a plug for, you know, there are physical therapists that know how to treat patients with osteoporosis. And it's probably appropriate to, to do that if possible, to learn the right exercises so then you can go do them at home. Right. For sure. There's a whole training for for physical therapists that they can get certified in um, on osteoporosis exercise and management. And so in different places, different you know therapists have different, you know, uh, 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 certification levels. But, you know, but there are a lot of uh, physical therapists and there's a, a category of physical therapists called women's health physical therapists. And there's a women's health certification. And they often see all of these issues that we're talking about and are kind of mm -hmm. specialists in these issues. So I'll, you know, I'll put a plug in for them. They existed way before I did. And in terms of a, or from a physician standpoint, but I work with them very closely and they, they're great resources for this type of um, problem. Yeah. So, I mean, important points, it's never too late to start doing this. It's great to start early, but many of, uh, you know, many people haven't started early, so it's never too late. I was spent the week last week with a woman at 48 who started exercising at age 48, and now she's like a, a does Ironman. So, you know, and right. she does ultra super marathons. So um, it's never too late to start um, carefully, of course. Correct. Um, okay. I want to make sure we get to the pelvic floor because that's- yeah. I've seen a lot of questions come in about okay. pelvic floor, and I know it's a concern for a lot of women. I will say, um, Dr. Bonder does a lot with the pelvic floor, but also our urogynecologists um, will evaluate women who have issues related to the pelvic floor, incontinence, and um, and weakness in that area. So there's a lot of overlap between the two specialties, but um, let's talk about the pelvic floor. Um, you want to talk about what you do when women have concerns about their pelvic floor? Yeah. I mean, so you brought up a, you know, a great point. I mean, you know, urogynecologists, you know, uh, who are, are basically gynecologists that really go and specialize in the pelvic floor and pelvic floor surgeries. Uh, and I work our close colleagues, right? We work very close together. I work a little bit more al along the, uh, the non-surgical aspect, like I, you know, kind of discussed earlier where, you know, from a pain management standpoint and from a pain perspective, uh, you know, patients who have pelvic floor pain that is, you know, of a muscle origin or nerve origin, or they're not sure what's causing it, but it's not one of, you know, it's not the couple of things that are caused by a surgical issue or by an infection or by cancer or anything like that. And we want to figure it out. Oftentimes the urogynecologist and I will work closely together to figure out what might be causing it. And so from a pelvic floor standpoint, strength and, you know, and then there's the idea of preventing incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse and strengthening your pelvic floor. Also that I see a lot of, I get a lot of questions, especially, I mean, it's so huge right now. I, I assume I'm not a big social media person. I'm on it a little bit, but not much, but like, I think the minute you say, tell social media or you're pregnant, like they get, <laughs> they get these Instagram posts and TikTok posts about your pelvic floor. And I have all these women coming into me that are pregnant. They'll be like, when should I come back and see you? Or what, how can I prevent, you know, damage to my pelvic floor during my delivery? Or when should I come see you afterwards? Because I want to, you know, rehab my pelvic floor correctly and make sure I prevent all the, the pelvic floor issues that can happen like prolapse and incontinence. So, so that's when someone can come see me. I mean, basically to talk to me about that. And then as, and, but also if you do develop those issues and you're not ready to have surgery and you're, you know, that you want to talk about how to strengthen the muscles then I'm, you know, I love to see those patients as well. And people, you know, that want to talk about that and how to incorporate the pelvic floor into your exercise program. So you'll often see patients who have concerns about their pelvic floor, and then you'll refer sometimes for pelvic floor physical therapy, which is different than the other physical therapy we were talking about. What is that? That's so, a, you know, a lot of people don't even know what it is. And um, it would be right. great to understand that. So pelvic floor physical therapy is uh, a physical therapist is the physical therapist who has the motor with like the osteoporosis training I was saying has even more specified training in pelvic floor conditions and treating them. And so they have specific knowledge to anatomy and syndromes and conditions that affect the pelvic floor. And the 
I guess it's also maybe important really quick for maybe someone who wasn't on like your pre the previous talk is like the pelvic floor. What does that really encompass? And, you know, when we talk about the pelvic floor, we talk about the pelvic floor muscles, which are the muscles that really control pee, poop, and sex is what I often say in terms of holding things in and, and controlling when you pee or poop, but also like the organs too, right? And like the organs are considered part of your pelvic floor as well. And pelvic floor organ prolapse or pelvic floor prolapse can, you know, it really sometimes will mean that too. So, you know, when we're talking about the muscles though, and the pelvic floor muscles that are, are dysfunctional and not functioning the way that they're supposed to, to help with those, those normal bodily kind of functions is when you can see a pelvic floor physical therapist and a pelvic floor, because they help you kind of rehab back from those conditions. So I'll often see a patient that, and diagnose them with, you know, you know, their weak muscles so that they need PT to strengthen it. But sometimes patients' muscles are kind of too tight or too, uh, you know, contracted and that causes pain and can also cause some, in, some incontinence and leakage. So you have to know that they should kind of, what we say, lengthen their muscles before you strengthen your muscles. Like, but anyway, I'm, I'm getting a little off. Kind of. so again, just to, because there's a question here right now, what is, yeah. what is the pelvic floor? Again, it's kind of confusing. What would right. you say the pelvic floor is? So to me, the pelvic floor or the pelvic floor muscles, like when I talk, you know, in terms of the muscles that really help, they sit at the bottom of your pelvis and they help control, make sure everything doesn't like kind of like fall out of your, like the organs fall out of your body. But they also are what you learn as a as a kid, as a baby or a toddler to control with potty training. So, you know, in terms of when to squeeze them in and when to let them go and when to relax them to help, you know, be potty trained are the are those muscles of the pelvic floor. And so I always say that sometimes we need to re get re potty trained. <laughs> like right. You know, so let's talk about that. One of the things, like besides the physical therapist, we can do it on our own. And that's everybody's heard right. of the Kegel exercises. And again, that's another thing you taught me different ways to do it years ago. So who should be doing Kegels? How do we do the Kegels? What are they for? You want to? So, you know, Kegels. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, everyone knows this word Kegels and those are really to help strengthen the pelvic floor muscles for sure, without a doubt. But not everybody needs to do Kegels also, you know, so we'll get, I mean, I can get to that, but like a Kegel, you know, the, the, the traditional way about like how to do a Kegel is that you kind of think about stopping, like as if someone opened the door on you while you're trying to go to the bathroom and, and you like, or, you know, kind of do that freeze and you hold it in and you squeeze to like, not let it to kind of drip. And so that's, so a lot of people will say to teach yourself to do it, you know, while you're urinating, try to stop the flow of urine. But, which is possible, but some people still have trouble doing that. And, and I'll also say that that's not a great thing to do on a regular basis. Like I just saw someone last week who was like, that's when I do my Kegels. I'll be peeing and I start like squeezing. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like that's not what you want to do. You know, you want to do them at other times, not when you're actually urinating. But like you were referring to one of the other great ways to get people to be able to do a Kegel when they don't, can't do it the first way is actually to holding, like to think about as if you were going to pass gas and you didn't want to, and you wanted to kind of like squeeze those muscles, like you were going to squeeze in holding, pa like passing gas. And that actually is exactly the same muscles, maybe a little bit different portion of them, but it still works those muscles and trying to, to um, strengthen them that way can be useful too. And so those are two, you know, ways that you can think about, there's lots of visual imageries and things that you can read about to try to to do it, but those are great ways to start getting in the habit of it. Right. So for some women, it's just easier to find the muscles if they're squeezing from the rear rather than squeezing from the front. Right. And you can figure out what's best for you. And so why do we do Kegels? We do them to strengthen the pelvic floor to help when like, you know, that when you get the key out of the door and you have that urge to go. So you have right. more strength in those muscles so that there is no leakage of urine. Exactly. Um, and um, so you, yeah, what were you going to say? No, no, I was just going to say, yeah, no, exactly. Like, you know, that's that they do strengthen the muscles, but I'll, I'll just make my, my plug for this idea that we always, when we strengthen muscles in general, we always want to lengthen the muscle and make sure before strengthening the muscle. And so, you know, if your muscle, so it is always kind of good to get checked by either myself or your gynecologist or even a physical therapist or your gy or regular gynecologist to see like if you're if you're if you're doing a lot of kegels 
and your muscles are tight, you're not going to get any stronger. You know, you're, you, the muscles need to be more relaxed before you can really strengthen them. And that's a hard thing for someone to figure out on their own. So if you're doing Kegels and you're not getting any better and you're not seeing any results on your own, that's when, you know, you should talk to your doctor. Yeah. And someone's asking about sexual function too. I mean, yes, yeah, strengthening the pelvic floor is good for your sexual function as, you, as long as you don't tighten it too much, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, you know, that, that gets into hormonal changes of menopause too, in terms of sexual function and, and, but, you know, yes, I mean, strengthening your pelvic floor muscles can definitely help with sexual function and stronger orgasms and, and help in that way as well. But you also, same idea is that, I, and this is like a really big thing for me is to not over strengthen the muscles or to strengthen muscles that are too tight. So there's, you know, there's people who will, you know, go do, you know, different types of procedures that you can get at places that, that are help, you know, rejuvenate the, the vaginal canal and kind of strengthen it a little bit, but you also want to make sure that you're not over strengthening it in that sense. I think that's such an important point. And just to reiterate, so you're a gynecologist, if you see someone, um, we'll do an evaluation why you're losing urine, why, you know, um, what's physically going on, and they will often do surgery. So if you wanted to try something else before you would go to surgery, pelvic floor PTC and seeing Dr. Bonder is a great idea. Right. Right. And so, and I'll just say, because some people get confused also about the difference between me and a physical therapist in terms of like that is that, you know, I will often refer to a physical therapist, but from a physician standpoint, can also diagnose what might be going on or, you know, figure out what kind of physical therapy is really going to be helpful, whether or not you should do any other treatment, or sometimes we have to do some diagnostic workup to figure out what might be going on or refer you to a different doctor that like, because it's not just your muscles and figuring out what might be happening before you actually go to physical therapy. And yes, and a physical therapist can do various things other than Kegels to help you strengthen the pelvic floor. So for sure. For sure. Yeah, yeah. There's lots of different things. They can do. Yeah. There are so many questions coming in, but there are also comments that people are saying that physical, uh, uh, pelvic floor PT has really made a difference in their lives. So it's just important. Like a lot of people don't know about it or feel uncomfortable with, going to a therapist who's actually going to touch you in the genital area, but it actually can be very helpful. Um, and this can be for women of all ages um, who are experiencing symptoms in their genital area. Um, we've covered a lot um, um, from our core to our pelvic floor, right? But right. I wanted, so um, do you have um, any take home messages that you wanna share with our viewers? Yeah, I mean, I think the 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 take home message for all of this is in terms of exercise as medicine to help you know treat and prevent a lot of these issues is that is is do is is to exercise and that's really important. But do what works for you and what you enjoy, right? So like if you're gonna you pick up something that you hate, you're never gonna do it, you know. So that's why I kind of alluded to earlier, like if you really enjoy Pilates, then do Pilates five, you know. All the time and don't worry about picking up heavy weights you know and heavy and so that's really is as you exercise you know as you're getting into an exercise routine whether it's for osteoporosis or for your pelvic floor or for your balance or for your your core support you know they all go together is do what work do what really what what you enjoy and it's never too late to start correct yes correct. it is not too late it is never too late to start. Uh, you know, of course, if you have any kind of health conditions, you want to talk to your doctor before you start any kind of exercise program. But, you know, even building up bone, you know, you know, it's hard to build up bone mass, you know, after um, once you're in perimenopause, and but you can still build, you can still build your strength and, and help your bone density overall. Yeah. Someone here writes more isn't better, better is better. So, right. That's another good point to yeah. do it, you know, under guidance, not guess if it's safe for you to be doing something. Right. Also. Yeah. No, I mean, the amount of people that I see and I ask, you know, come in for back pain or, and I ask them to show me how they're doing a simple dead bug, like I mentioned before and kind of go through. And part of it is that they're straining their back because they're not doing these exercises correctly. And so that's, you know, a big, a big passion of mine. And why I say exercise is medicine and talking about this is, is really important. E yeah. Even though that's like, like, you know, on a clinical day-to-day -day basis, it's not what I do all day long, but it's, it's a huge passion. Of mine. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, you are terrific. I think everybody here is going to want to see you. But <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you for joining me this evening. I learned so much from you, and I hope everybody thank you else for having you. Sure. Thank. Just as a quick reminder to everyone, if you'd like to schedule an appointment, here is the phone number. You can also scan the QR code. Or you can, of course, visit us online at Wild Cornell and look for our Women's Center. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And as a reminder, a recording of tonight's session will be sent to everyone who registered. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful evening.